Greg, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Greg, always great to chat with you about bonds and global debt and all kinds of macroeconomic things. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're speaking now at the end of July 2022, and it's uh, interesting to s- see the things that are happening around the world. Uh, I'm curious just to get your high-level view from a macroeconomic perspective. What are the What are the important factors in your mind that you're looking at? Well, I'm going to steal a tweet. Uh, from uh, a good young trader, I think, that uh, the, the synopsis is, we are all trading derivatives of the United States federal fund rate. And when you think about that, it makes a ton of sense because the USA Fed funds rate basically sets the discount rate for the world, okay? Everything trades off of the U.S., discount rate, which sets the U.S. 10-year rate, which sets discount rates for global bonds. It sets discount rates for global equities. Uh, It'll set uh, a a certain level. It'll have some impacts on credit default swap spreads. Uh, So it was quite an astute uh, commentary. And so on that, I think we have to evaluate what I view the Fed uh, latest announcement. So two days ago, Wednesday, uh, Jerome Powell came out and raised rates to two uh, by seventy five basis points to two and a quarter at uh, with for a range of two and a quarter to two and a half percent. Fed funds are overnight. Uh, the market reacted positively, and it's interesting to see the the um, d- diverging views. Uh, I actually thought that this was the first level of his pivot. Now, it's not a pure pivot, but I believe he has introduced some language called, uh, you know, which is, for example, the Fed is now at neutral. Okay. How can you be at neutral when inflation is 9% and Fed funds is 2.5%? I find that absolutely ridiculous, but... They introduced this this word. Then they also introduced, again, the terminology data dependent, which means they've been focusing on backward looking data. Employment numbers are strong. Yeah, that's good. But look at all the layoffs that are coming. Look at all the high tech companies that have announced that they're going to uh, uh, be laying off employees, etc. So employment is always backward looking. The Fed says that, you know, they're now going to be data dependent. So before, Stefan, they, they had a four and a half percent overnight rate target. I don't even think they get to 3%. That's my personal opinion. But even if they only do get to 3%, it's a form of a pivot in my opinion. And that's why you saw risk markets rally very hard. Now, it could be a combination of short covering and a combination of the the tech uh, sector getting a bid because if you have a lower US 10-year rate, On long duration assets, which tech stocks tend to be, the valuations can go higher as long as the discount rate doesn't go from 3% to 4.5% and then adding on the equity premium, okay? It's it's just a knee-jerk reaction. I'm not calling risk markets, you got to go in. But what I am saying is risk markets interpreted it like I did. I think that this was more dovish than the market's thought. Now you'll get the other side of the coin. You'll get people that are saying, my God, he was so hawkish. I think he's a horrible poker player. Okay. He was up on, he was up on the podium. His cards were shaking. He looked to me like he's holding a pair of nines and he's trying to pretend he has a full house. Okay. And he just did not look, he says stuff like we're going to crush inflation. Yeah, that's a good one. Like you're shaking like a leaf. You're going to crush inflation and also send the global risk markets into the into the toilet. So there's no way that GDP can grow. All of these things are problems. Um, I I view it, Stefan, as the, uh, the as a a degree of a pivot. And you know, it, it's markets are forward looking. So I think this is meaningful. What does it mean? It means QE infinity. Okay, very simply, they are going to have to print forever. It's only mathematics. And that means you need to hold hard assets that will maintain their value against, 
forever decreasing or debasing fiat unit of account. Yeah, I, th- I think you've got a really interesting and well nuanced analysis because it, you're right. It depends who you're listening to. There are people out there with all kinds of different views, but this notion of a Fed pivot has been something the market has been anticipating. And people, if we re- rewind the clock three, six months ago, it's it was definitely a different perception. It was seen like, right. oh, the Fed is going to really tighten. They're going to really, uh, because in their Keynesian minds, they're thinking, oh, they're going to put the brakes. They're going to pump the brakes. And we the economy has to deal with that. But eventually, the narrative was, oh, the Fed is going to have to pivot. And so now, as you rightly say, it seems like they are at least slowing down at least in their in their putting it in their mindset right i think so because think of it okay so they're at two and a half percent now they may have one or two more rate increases before december i again i don't think they do but we're, we're starting we're talking rounding errors so another 25 or 50 basis points is not a 75 or 100 basis point shocker i think at the september meeting they pause okay which means Really, by December, you have two chances to raise rates. And then there are people who are saying in 2023, they're going to have to start cutting rates. Well, why raise rates to cut them right away? Maybe you just wait for this to to, to the data to come in for other markets to stabilize or at least, you know, show what's really happening. Did you see the results out of Germany? I mean, they are horrible, horrible. So the euro you know, is going to be under pressure against the uh, American dollar if rates continue to rise in the USA. Same thing with the Japanese yen. All of this stuff are pressures building in the system and something always breaks. So again, all I will, I, I will tell you is I interpreted this as the first step in a longer term pivot And even if it's not a pivot, it's a slowing of the acceleration of the rate increases, okay? It's not always the first derivative. It can be the second derivative as well, which means they just did 75 basis points and 75 basis points. Even if they do 25 basis points, it's a market decrease in the acceleration. So it's a deceleration of your uh, Fed funds policy. Look, markets are on the head of a pin right now. Lots of people are hedged and wedged. There's short covering, there's no question, but that sometimes begets, oh my goodness, I can't miss the chance to buy NASDAQ stocks when they're down, you know, what are they down, 20 odd percent, or they were at least 20 odd percent off of uh, all time highs. So, you know, this is how markets work. This is how they flush themselves out. The most important thing to remember for the listeners, again, I believe that you need to store your assets in hard assets. So store your capital or store your time and energy in hard assets that will maintain value in the face of a debasing currency. That does not include bonds. Bonds are a fiat contract. Yes, they may pop a little in price, but it's still debasing so quickly. There's no way that the coupon on those bonds makes up for the debasement of the currency. This is a tough market for the 60-40 balanced portfolio, if you will, 60% equities, 40% bonds. You need other assets introducing, you know, the traditional ones, which gold, silver, but then the most beautiful one, the basis for our love of Bitcoin. It is exactly why Bitcoin was designed. QE infinity, mathematics, always start with math. Uh, The base layer of language is like, is how I like to say. Yeah, and you have a great way of really zooming out and explaining where we are in the global situation. And so where are we today if we look at, say, global debt versus GDP? And what do those numbers, just kind of at a high level, what do they look like today? Well, these numbers are based, uh, these are somewhat dated, and they haven't gotten better. So I'm, I'm throwing out numbers that are absolutely putrid. And they actually have gotten worse, but they haven't been updated. So I always look at things on a macro basis and I'm a debt guy. So I like to evaluate things on what's called enterprise value. A lot of people always look at market cap. They forget about the prior ranking debt. Well, that's the wrong way to look at stuff. If you have a prior claim in front of you, 
Don't look at market cap. You better look at debt. So total global debt is four times total global GDP. Four times is the equivalent of a company that has an enterprise value that's trading extremely rich to its sales price. If you want to look at, uh, so GDP is global sales. Total debt is one portion of enterprise value, but four times total debt to GDP means that unless GDP maintains a growth rate that can keep up with the organic growth rate of the coupon, because that's what a debt contract is, it has, an, it has a fiat contract, an organic growth rate, your debt spiral is going to grow in the absence of irresponsible politicians that keep adding more to the deficit, okay? So like I like to play a game. What's an average coupon that should be on the, on the, on, in the numerator? And this is total global debt. So this includes U.S. government debt, you know, all government debts around the world. It includes all banks, structured product, high yield corporate debt, all of it. I think it's fair to say that if the U.S. 10-year rate is 3%, the actual coupon on all of this debt, uh, a blended coupon is far higher than 3%. But let's just use 3% just as a conservative number. If your numerator is four times your denominator, your tax base, and it's four times a coupon of 3%, is it likely that your tax base or your global GDP is going to grow by 12% annually just to keep pace with the organic growth of the debt, not even including other, oh, we just found this other thing, this spending on, on inflation uh, package that the U.S. is, and it's fully paid for. What a load of hookah, fully paid for. It's fully paid for because you're not going to pay for any of your other debt that you owe. Like, what a bunch of buffoons. But point is, your debt spiral is being fed by the growth of it organically because of the coupon. We are reaching an accelerating debt spiral where escape velocity is impossible, literally impossible, except for one way that Luke Groman points out, which is basically financial repression, which basically absolutely screws bonds. What they would allow to happen is the denominator would grow like the rate of inflation and the numerator would be capped in its growth because they would use yield curve control like in Japan. So they would try to grow themselves back on side using an inflating economy to, and, and a capped yield so that your debt spiral is slowing. <laughs> In that scenario, all paths lead to Bitcoin. It's another form of debasing of the currency. And you don't want to be a bondholder there. Now, I've covered my bond shorts, okay? I am not advocating shorting bonds here, but I'm certainly not advocating being a long bond holder over the, you know, a bond holder over the long term. You want to trade bonds. You think you're an absolute star. You might be picking up nickels in front of a steamroller as far as I'm concerned, but go ahead, knock yourself out. It's just a horrible investment long-term. So the 60-40 portfolio is dead. This year, the 60-40 portfolio has been down double digits, both equities and bonds in the first time in history. Both have recorded double-digit declines for the first six months of the year. It's never happened, so there's been no buffering or no bal you know, offsetting of the risk. So pension funds all around the world have been destroyed this last uh, semi-annual period, and they need assets that are non-correlated with this over time. You know, the hard asset story is alive and well, in my opinion. Some of the, you know, Bitcoin certainly was not a star at this time, but Bitcoin is still a little bit in its uh, early days. People don't truly understand its uh, risk mitigating properties. I think that'll happen. And I'm really proud to say, I'm not sure if you saw that, that uh, Zero Hedge published an article last night that I've been banging the drum on for a while that yes. Bitcoin is basically 
the equivalent of credit default swap insurance. They said on the U.S. Fed, I'm like, don't stop with the Fed. It's credit default swap insurance on all central banks around the planet. So I think that'll happen over time, Stefan, where Bitcoin will be a non-correlated asset that will actually shine when other assets are getting, uh, you know, debased or you risk off, however you want to call it. So it's an interesting time. Let me tell you, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities in the market right now, but you don't want to get too far over your skis. You never know where there's another, you know, leverage unwind coming, whether it's in the TradFi space or in the, the, the crypto ecosystem. Got to be careful. Uh, that being said, you know, smart money is making adjustments as the information changes. Excellent. And to your credit, you have been banging the drum about the CDS uh, component or aspect of Bitcoin, it being protection. And maybe one way to frame it is a very cheap protection. I think that's something I've seen you, uh, one way you've framed this. And you make it a really interesting point because, as you said, back to those numbers with the uh, 3% and uh, the um, four times, uh, 4x you know, global debt to GDP. It's and that's and the thing is, even there, you're actually bending over backwards to be conservative and helpful to that <laughs> case because the reality is, it might not even be three percent interest. It might be four or five percent. In which case, and, the, then yeah. the global uh, growth rate shouldn't be twelve percent; it should be sixteen percent or twenty percent. And we know, yeah. you know, even a, you know, historically, even countries that are growing very quickly, they might be doing you know seven or eight <laughs> percent. And like an average country is lucky to get two or three percent GDP growth per year, so we are well, well below the level that would be required to so-called grow out of this debt problem. And so it just brings all of these problems around. What is the way this this resolves? Obviously, I'm with you. I think the inflationary pathway is the most likely. Now, of course, not endorsing. We're just saying this is the most likely pathway. It's the least bad from the from the politicians and the government and the systems point of view. That's pr- arguably the least bad way out of this. Um, but I, I, I want to touch on this point you mentioned as well, because you mentioned earlier that 6040 is having one of the worst years of its entire, you know, in history, 6040. So 60% stocks and 40% bonds. It's a typical thing that people get put into as an allocation. Now, I'm curious, Greg, y- your point of view here. Do you see that there will be some investors who are angry at their financial managers who put them into a 60-40? Are they going to be angry and calling them up and saying, hey, get me out of this? Or do you see it like potentially some of these investors are in bonds because they have to be, because of various reasons, mandate, government, regulation, etc.? There will always be unhappy uh, unit holders uh, having managed money. It's a horrible job, okay? Why? Well, if somebody puts money with you and you do really well, they were really smart to put money with you. Okay. Had nothing to do with you. It's how smart they were to put money with you. Right. And then if they put money with you and you crap the bed, even if markets, you've outperformed your, your benchmark, you're down, but Hey, I'm presenting you with a return of minus 15%, but the benchmark was minus 22. So look at me. I'm such a star. They look at you like, how are you a star? You, you lost me 15%. You're the idiot, not me for putting money with you. You're the idiot. So, you know, it's a bit of a asymmetric uh, reward uh, position to sit in that chair. Some of clients are good. Some of them understand what it really means in the longer term, though. And you mentioned this. Okay. Advocating for something different than the 60-40 portfolio doesn't mean 100% equities and 0% bonds, and it doesn't mean you do it right away. What it does mean is, in my opinion, as I've said before, I like, would like all asset managers in the world to attain at least a 5% weighting in Bitcoin. All I'm saying is where should that 5% uh, allocation come from? Absolutely, it comes from bonds before it comes from equities. Absolutely, it comes from bonds before it comes from commodities. So let's say commodities was a portion. Point is to not confuse the math. 60, 40 
should become 60 35 5. Over time, sell some bonds, buy some Bitcoin. Bonds are a, an asset that's a fiat contract that are programmed to debase, whereas Bitcoin is an asset that is programmed to increase in value relative to the unit of account, the bond unit of account, or the fiat unit of account. So, it, it, you know, people always overthink this. And I did say this on stage at Bitcoin Miami, and I think it went over a lot of people's heads. But the funny thing is, if I ever do succeed in getting a big pension plan to put 5% of their assets in Bitcoin, it's like they forget what the other 95% of their assets are. Then they're only focused on this Bitcoin thing. Oh my God, it's gone down. It's gone down. Dude, if you own Shopify stock, it's gone down way more than Bitcoin has. Oh, well, yeah, well, we own Shopify because it's in the index. So everybody has to own Shopify. Well, stop your belly aching then. Focus on the fact that over time, I believe Bitcoin will be embraced as a, in, 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 in the words of, a, uh, uh, of an asset manager, a non-correlated asset that will provide diversification benefits, which is to say, you can reduce the risk of your overall portfolio and maintain the same level of expected return. Or the flip side is you can keep the same level of risk in your portfolio and enhance your expected level of return because of an asset like Bitcoin. It's so exciting where this is going, not just price wise, but just what you see out in the markets to find, right? You're, you're there, you're seeing the, the, the apps that are being built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I mean, these user adoption numbers are absolutely out, astounding. And it's a combination of a technology and a store of value that over time will disintermediate the visas of the world. That'll disintermediate a lot of the traditional finance, uh, management, traditional finance payment rails. This is something that you cannot afford to have a zero exposure to Bitcoin. The risk of having a zero exposure far outweighs the risk of having a 5% exposure that can ha have asymmetric returns that are non-correlated to other risk assets. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think part of this is that journey of people changing their default in their mind away from the default 60-40 or whatever their typical allocation is. And look, the other reality is there's a lot of individuals out there, just everyday people, they've got their government uh, superannuation fund or pension or and the money's just going into these things without them knowing. So they already are exposed to bonds. They just don't even know it. So I think that's an important thing that, you know, I think that people have unfortunately been pushed into a system where maybe they don't really have that much control over their own retirement accounts and what's going into them and you know how to do that stuff. Um, I, I, what, I want to also ask as well about in terms of where this goes, right? So as we said, we've got this very high debt to GDP ratio just globally. And in terms of the ways things could potentially shake out in the future. Now, I'm obviously I'm with you. I think the likely scenario and arguably the less bad scenario is inflation. But what about some other scenarios if they try to find another way to make somebody else take a loss? So as an example, what about just explicitly defaulting or you know you, I'm sure you might have heard of cases where in China in some of the banks there and some of the mortgages there are people who are literally just not paying the mortgage. And so in those cases, who who's going to wear the loss in those kinds of scenarios? So let's uh, let's def define some different type of scenarios that could be very painful. Uh, one is called a bail-in that was actually used in, in Cyprus uh, in, in uh, 2013. The Correct. Okay. What happens is uh, depositors' money in, uh, in banks over a certain level uh, become, hey, it's not your money anymore. Uh, and what does that do? Well, that basically allows the... Um, government to take those funds and take them away from you uh, and bail out the bank a little bit because those funds are like debt relief. Okay. What in any of these scenarios, debt relief 
is, you know, what is a default? Well, it's debt relief because basically then you have to restructure the debt and the chances are you cut your debt in half or more. The reality is, though, that would be absolutely, in my opinion, so cataclysmic and, and so uh, disruptive to the, the functioning of the fiat system. Everything would stop, okay? It would make the great financial crisis look like a walk in the park. Like you talking about the potential default of even a, a G7 country, let alone the most important country of the world, the USA, I, I can't even fathom the, the uh, grinding to a halt of the financial system measurement measured by things like OIS over LIBOR, the LIBOR OIS spread, which in the great financial crisis blew out to you call it four four percent. It's a it's a measure of the stresses in the in the banking system. Well, four percent would probably go to ten percent, which means any bank loan would be priced at ten percent plus whatever they're charging you for your credit risk. At the end of the day, do things work at a ten percent interest rate when? Right now, we can't even make the government or the global debt markets work at a 3%. Stefan, it's, it's like, again, it's only the math. Like, there is no way to escape this unless they do financial repression, which is a long-term, slower bleed punishment of bonds or a fixed income contract. Uh, that's what essentially Japan is doing right now. Everyone says, well, look at the Japan, the Japanese experience. It hasn't been that bad. Yeah, don't forget, Japan was a net exporter. It's not the USA, which is a net importer. That little difference between being a net exporter and a net importer changes your whole GDP equation and makes the math again not work. So all paths lead to Bitcoin, in my opinion. It's either financial calamity which I think a lot of Bitcoiners actually want. I don't want financial calamity. I, I can promise you my children don't want financial calamity because the pain and the social unrest would be far outweigh the potential benefits to, oh yeah, well, Bitcoin is, the, is now the global reserve asset. Look, we can get to global reserve asset status without having to go through uh, you know, some sort of Armageddon scenario. And that's what I'm, I believe is going to happen. That's what I believe the governments, not that they're going to embrace Bitcoin globally. Some governments will, those first movers will be uh, advantaged. But the reality is, you know, in order to survive social, um, a civil war, potentially, you have to just keep the, the, the people happy they're not happy with inflation, but the alternative is, again, are, will you be happy when there's, you know, you, you, there's war in the streets? I don't think so. So let's hope that we can solve this uh, with a slow bleed in the traditional finance system and people learn that Bitcoin is their escape, uh, you know, is their lifeboat. Very simply, use fiat money as your checking account. Use Bitcoin as your store of value savings account. Countries should do the same. Fiat money is good for avoiding barter. It allows a price to be set so you don't have to trade uh, goods for other goods. You can have an intermediary currency. But fiat money is not good for saving. And that's where Bitcoin comes in. So Jeff Booth and I love to say, you want to develop this parallel system over time that is able to absorb the reality of the fiat death spiral. You don't want that death spiral to happen tomorrow. It could, but you don't actually want it to. You build this parallel system that will allow for an orderly transfer is would be the, uh, the best outcome in my mind. Right. And of course, I, I'm with you there. I think that uh, that would be less bad than the other scenarios. Unfortunately, that's where we are right now. Uh, but I think here's the other point. Bitcoin today is very small. 
it's only about 450 billion as a total market as we speak today. Of course, we all want it to be bigger, but that can pause oppose challenges for large companies or governments who want to take a large position without, let's say, moving uh, moving the the market. And it may be challenging for some of these large enti- investment entities, pension funds and the like, to take a meaningful position in Bitcoin because, you know, as you said, 5%. But if they all went 5% into Bitcoin today, I mean, the price of Bitcoin would absolutely it would, skyrocket it would go, at that it would go point. To, it, would go to, it would essentially go to $2 million, okay? That's where Bitcoin would go because let's run through that math. I don't think I've done it on your show, but I have done it in the past. That, that incidentally is my price target, okay? It's not my limit. It's my price target in US dollars for Bitcoin. And it's based on today's dollars. And how do I get there? I start with what are total global financial assets. And that number is 900 trillion US dollars around the globe. It includes all the debt that I talked about, $400 trillion worth of debt. It includes $300 trillion US dollars worth of real estate. Okay. It includes $100 trillion worth of equities and $100 trillion worth of commodities and other uh, hard assets. You know, gold is 10 trillion of that. So you have 400 plus 300 plus 100 plus 100. That's 900 trillion US dollars. What's 5% of that? 45 trillion. Yeah. 45 trillion. What is 45 trillion divided by 21 million? There's your $2 million price target. Okay. In today's dollars. Now, don't get mad with me, all you Bitcoin maxis. Why am I so bearish? Okay. It's a target. It's not a limit. And it has to go through my price target before it goes through your price target, which is some guys are like, you know, 10 times my price target. It's all possible. But here's the crazy thing. Right now, based on its potential, Bitcoin is such a rounding error that you have to have exposure to it. So if Bitcoin price target, my price target is 2 million, and I'm looking at your block clock right behind you, and I'm assuming it's right. Let's just, to make the math easy though, say it's 20,000. 20,000 is one one hundredth of 2 million. Okay. The market is basically telling me that there's a 1% chance I'm right. Okay. 20,000 divided by 2 million. 1%. And I'm not 100% certain I'm right, Stefan, but I'm way higher than 1%. Like you fired in ice holes. You got to do the math. This is the best asymmetric return I have ever seen in my life. And you don't care if you get in and you move the price from 20 to 40. At least you're in. Because then at 40, it still has 50 times, 50 multiples upside, which means it's a 2% chance now. You moved it from a 1% to a 2% chance. The market is telling you you're right. My, I think I'm like 70% chance that it's going there. So if I'm a big fund and I've done the math, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to move the market. But guess what? It's a rounding error. I got to get in. It's the price of admission. You know, Bitcoin is actually a better risk adjusted opportunity today at 20,000 than it was when I first got involved in it. In 2016, at under $1,000 US per Bitcoin. And everyone will say, how is that possible? And I'll just say three things. Adoption, the federal, the the response to uh, uh, COVID, the government response to COVID, which was unprecedented, $9 trillion of global money printing. Okay, unprecedented in the in the great financial crisis. I mean, you know, there was maybe two million, two trillion dollars. Now we're at nine trillion dollars. And then the most important part of it, it's five years down the road. It's it's worked for five more years. It's it's security. The network security is higher than it's ever been or close to as high as it's ever been. All of these indicate that the likelihood of me attaining my price target is actually higher. So even though it went from 1,000 to 20,000, 20 times higher, it's better today 
more likely to obtain, attain my, my final price target than it was five years ago. I, 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 you know, I lose my voice sometimes. I run into a wall. I smash my head against the wall. I cannot, for the life of me, understand why people don't see how simple this is. But they look at the donut <clears throat> and they focus on the hole. They don't focus on the donut. They focus on the hole. They're like, well, it was at 70 and it went down to 30. And oh, my goodness. And Well, you grow up, people. Learn how to manage risk, okay? This is the opportunity now. Even at 70000 I thought it was cheap based on a credit default swap analysis. By a credit default swap analysis, I think Bitcoin should be trading at $400,000 today. Just on the CDS analysis. But it's not. And it's not my price target either. But the point is using another mathematical way of looking at it. 400000 it's one twentieth of its price. So all, all I will say is it, this is a tough, uh, a tough sale to a lot of people. Uh, what we need to do is get uh, the education out there. You're doing a great job. I love what you're doing. I mean, sometimes I'm not the world's best educator because I get upset and I use my old trading floor language. And I apologize people to people, right? I swear because I care. Like I really cannot for the life of me understand how people who are paid to do smart risk analysis still have their head in the sand when it comes to this asset class. And I'm curious as well then, you're pointing out that there are some of these people who should have better risk management, better analysis capabilities. Is it also then that there's certain individuals that if you got to them, if you could orange pill those individuals, that that would really move the needle because they are in command or have some way to influence the allocation of larger pools of capital um, as opposed to, let's say, a lot of retail individuals. Of course, not anti the retail individuals, but in this sense, I guess the point we're making, uh, you're making here is that certain individual, in, individuals can really move the needle. The most important uh institution on that front in my opinion today is fidelity which has you know it's a top five global asset manager it's done incredibly good research it has uh yuri and timmer who's uh you know he has price targets of over a million dollars on bitcoin using uh things like cell phone adoption uh com comparison and internet adoption comparison uh the Abigail Johnson, the CEO of Fidelity, has been testing Bitcoin mining for 10 years. It, 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 and they've come out with this research. And they, as you know, in the USA are accepting Bitcoin in 401k accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're getting pushback from some of the U.S. senators who are brain dead uh, financial risk managers. That's OK. What the more important part is the Black Rocks of the world, which compete against Fidelity. And they're both going to have the same client. And if the client comes to BlackRock and says, I'm going to move my money from you to Fidelity unless you provide a Bitcoin silo, BlackRock will really quickly provide a Bitcoin silo. Okay. So I see that happening. I see Fidelity doing great research. I like that institution. I always have. I viewed them as a, uh, a uh, trailblazer. They uh, did great things in Canada. Um, here's, here's what I do know. The other guy that I think is becoming a Bitcoiner, uh, and I'm not going to put these words in his mouth, but I saw him on CNBC the other day, Mohammed Alarian. Uh, now that guy is smart. Okay. I'm not knocking all risk managers as not being sharp. Alarian is smart. I know he knows the benefits of, uh, a diversified portfolio with asymmetric return possibilities. Asymmetric investments define careers. If your 1% allocation to Bitcoin goes up 100-fold, that 1% and you had 99% in other assets, let's assume those other $99 on $100, they keep its value. And your $1 goes up to $100 because it went up 100 times. Your entire portfolio now is 50% in Bitcoin, right? Assuming you didn't sell any. And the $99 is still 99, but the Bitcoin went from $1 to $100. That is the possibility here. And this is why you cannot afford to have zero. 
Because if you have $100 in non-Bitcoin and your competitors have $1 in Bitcoin and 99 in the same stuff that you have, you've just lost out to the best asymmetric return ever. And your unit holders are going to be bitching to you, like we just talked about, how could you have missed this opportunity? Well, li having lived it and, and you know, it, the craziest thing is, you know, people are very, um, they're, money is so precious to them that they make irrational decisions all the time, okay? Um, the the irrationality of it is due to um, emotions. When you let emotions impact your investing, you tend to make horrible investment decisions. Some people hate Bitcoin. They don't, they can't get over it. Peter Schiff is that type of individual. I, I'm afraid that Shifty Pete has got to learn to change his portfolio allocation when the information changes. So let me just answer, not answer this phone. I just, uh, uh, all right, hold on. Anyway, you know what? The, the, the point is, please, guys, remove emotions from your trades. Remove emotions. And that's why sometimes computers are better traders than humans. Computers trade based on price with no emotion. When something hits a price, it buys because it's programmed to buy or sell. The, the emotion of the person, the, the emotion of the person, of the person um, who is uh, making this decision or programming the computer is different. But you know, you cannot, you cannot allow yourself to fall into these problems. Yeah, of course. And I think that's also perhaps part of the reasoning why there's the message around auto DCA, right? Like that companies like Correct. Swan and others 100%. have this, this idea that you can automate your savings. I think part of that though is for some people, depending on where they're at in their life, it's about whether they are able to save in Bitcoin. Because part of that is you do have to be able to take some volatility. And I think you have to. That's that for some people is uh, depending on where you're at. If you're able to save and you're able to stomach that volatility, um, others will sort of run for. Uh, who's the, who's a guy? Bill Miller. Okay, yeah. greatest greatest uh, thing uh, phrase. Volatility is the price of return. Okay, if if I show you an asset that has very low volatility, chances are its return profile will bump around just above zero, okay? Here's the craziest thing. You know what vol measures, right? It measures, okay, so I'm trying to draw a graph on your screen. Top right, top left to bottom right, a straight line down. Yeah. No volatility, straight line down. Is that thing non-risky? No, you've lost money from there to there, but there's been no volatility. It's gone straight down. People who measure risk by using volatility forget that you can be in a straight line down with no volatility and still lose your shirt. And the same thing applies to a straight line up with sawtooth, okay? Even though you got to look at the, you know, the, the regression to the mean. This is what's happening. Don't focus on this thing. And all of these guys who, you know, uh, use things like um uh, vol uh what's the term uh at risk your um value at risk value at risk thank you your var your value at risk is all based on volatility sometimes it's asinine because they'll say hey you can have all of this oh and guess what over time it goes straight down with no vol straight line down all of these systems were built at times when you know, oh, computers, they're going to make my life so much easier. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes computers mess things up just because you're able to measure so many different variables at one time. Yeah. And I think for some individuals who like to trade a lot, like day traders, they often end up losing money because uh, there are some statistics that have been done and studies showing that some of the regular traders were the ones who lost a lot of money, as in uh, people who are just trying to play these either in equities or in futures and other things and uh 
I've done yeah. this for 35 years. I've done this for 35 years. All I bring to the table is 35 years of mistakes, okay? And I learn from every single mistake I make. And the key is not to keep making the same mistake. And the very most important key is remove emotion and cut your losses. Ride your winners and cut your losers. Whereas most people do the absolute opposite. They like to crystallize their gains. They like to be able to go to a, a cocktail party and say, Haha, I bought Bitcoin at 100 and I sold it at 500. They forget to tell you that now it's trading at 15,000. Okay. And, and, you know, but they, they wanted to crystallize that gain. So they sold it at 500 and now it's many times multi higher. And then they never tell you about that penny stock that they bought at 10 bucks. That's now trading at two bucks, but they're praying that it comes back to $10, right? Because they kept their losers and they sold their winners. So again, Stefan, I bet you in my life, I might have a 60% batting average on winning to losing trades. Okay. And that's way above average. I promise you. And that being said, the only thing I do well is on the 40% of my losing trades. They're gone. I'm not emotionally attached to them. They're, they're off the table. They're out of my conscience. Okay. I might've had the long-term plan, right? But my exit or entry was, was horrible. You know, the worst expression in managing money is we were early. Ah, <laughs> uh, early. Yeah, yeah. Is you wrong. were early. <laughs> Correct. You were wrong for the time frame that you said you were early, right? So be careful about all that stuff. I'm not advocating. Uh, firstly, there's a couple of things I need to, people to understand. They say, Foss, you trade Bitcoin. I say, I've spent my life as a trader. Okay. I have a core holding in Bitcoin. I will never be short Bitcoin. But are there times that I trade it? Come on, guys. I'd be lying to you. Of course I trade it. I've done this for 35 years. Okay. Then they'd say, all right, what are, what's your ideal or what's your core holding? Well, I'll share with you that my core holding is above 25% and less than 50%. They'll be like, why aren't you 100%? And I go, because you don't have to be 100% allocated to this most beautiful asymmetric return in order to to reap the benefits, okay? And when you're not 100% allocated, what it means is you can take some profits, you can wait for the, the, the price to potentially come back down. If it doesn't, you're still above your core holding number. And I'll talk to you in 20 years. I think that there's a lot of people out there that should actually just DCA and hodl until they get to their portfolio weight. But then there's other people, and I've talked to, you know, a friend who is a little boisterous out there, Bitcoin Tina, who Bitcoin Tina has admitted that, you know, he has now realized that perhaps his weighting was a little too high in Bitcoin, and he wasn't, he didn't sell enough when it was above 50K, because now he can't buy anymore when it's below 20K, and now he wants to actually reevaluate his past forward. Uh, Tina, please don't, you know, I'm... Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, whatever the doxing you or whatever, you've admitted that on a podcast with me and I'm good with it because look, I do the same thing. My entire life has always been manage risk as the information comes in. And if the information changes and your position is wrong, guess what? Change your position. That's why I find the best traders. You know who the best traders are on Wall Street? They're women. Women are actually better traders than men, I've noticed, on Wall Street. Right. Um, they, can I, they can remove the emotion better than men can. I see. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I wonder if it's, is it a, like, a survivor bias thing? Is it just a, yeah, the ones who survive well, are the, the males, ones who manage the males, their emotions like, better? Yeah. The male. The, I'm, I'm too proud to admit this loss. I'm going to show the market who's right. I'm going to bully the market to, 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 to see that very few people are bigger than the market. Okay. And when you become bigger than the market, you probably become something like the JP Morgan whale that almost brought down the whole bank on a credit default swap position that was mismanaged out of Europe. So far from home, uh, you know, greater, the greater, the play pen farther from home. JP Morgan had this London based whale that almost brought down the bank on some crazy ass 
uh, structured product credit default swap thing where the guy was too proud that he wouldn't uh, absorb his losses. He tried to force the market into his position and almost brought down the bank. Like, again, uh, uh, you know, credit where credit is due. One of the best traders at JP Morgan that I ever transacted, transacted with was uh, a, a young lady, one of the founders of the credit default swap market, to be, to be honest. She was absolutely unemotional about her trades. And well, it appeared so anyway. And I thought she was absolutely fantastic. And many other female traders that I've traded with, I found the same thing. And I, sometimes I have to check my own, own emotion, right? Stefan, if I ever think I'm bigger than a market, okay, time for you to check out, Foss. Like you have lost your mind, okay? The only market that you're bigger than is the, is the, the cell that you should be in a padded little room. Uh, you know, thinking that you're, uh, you know, the master of your own domain that uh, please people manage risk properly, understand that there, there's nobody who has a hundred percent batting average, nobody. And, and think of baseball where, you know, a 300 batting average is like outrageously good. Maybe it, it, it takes time to learn that. The best way you learn it is by losing money, unfortunately, but that's generally the only way you learn. So, I mean, I, I'm not trying to give people trading 101 tips here. Get your allocation. In my opinion, it should be a minimum of 5%. Then we'll talk. Hopefully that 5% will happen with people that deserve to get it before the price goes parabolic. Um, you know, I want countries like El Salvador to get as much as they need before the price goes parabolic. Uh, because you know what? I love the USA, but they already have all the money. It's not like they need more money. It's countries like El Salvador that need to have to experience the upside. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so uh, let's also chat about your website. You've got lookingglasseducation.com. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? And I was checking out some of your articles there as well. So uh, tell us a little bit about this. What a great question. Thanks for bringing it up. Very proud to be a partner in that effort. Um, run by a two young kids, one of whom lives in uh, uh, Western Australia, I think. But his name's Daz B., Last oh, yeah. name spelled B E A. Same on Twitter, yeah. Great kid. Okay, a little bit older than I. I'm not sure how old you are, but definitely younger than me. So I call him a kid. All right. Uh, and then, and then, uh, uh, so he there's Daz, and then there's Sebastian Bunny, uh, a trans, uh, well, an expat New Zealand kid who I ski with in what in Whistler in the winters. Just a great guy, huge brain, 29 years old, trying to change the world putting together this free education for people. So Daz and, uh, and Seb are our co-CEOs, uh, if you will, that are putting together this free education for, for uh, people to understand the fallacy of the fiat system. Stuff you won't learn in school, because if you did learn it in school, you would never um, uh, deposit your money in a commercial bank. Uh, honestly, you wouldn't because you'd realize the risk that you have by depositing your money in the commercial bank. Point is free education, young, motivated kids that are changing the world. And here's some examples. Uh, it's been translated into the 18 different languages. They're using it as part of the curriculum in El Salvador already. Okay. We've had talks with Madeira. We've had talks with uh, 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 Brazil translating it into Portuguese. So all of these things are so positive. It's only been out for, we announced it at the, uh, at the Bitcoin Miami conference this year. And already there's been something like, uh, I might have the number slightly wrong. Uh, over 3000 people have completed the course, the online course, which gives, you know, it's a bit of a, it's an accreditation that says, yeah, congratulations. You went through this learning process where you actually see some of the risks in the Fiat Ponzi that I like to describe it as, but they can't have uh, a full on FOSS uh, indoctrination. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll think I'm some sort of madman. Okay. They need the kids doing it. You know, basically it's, how would you say it's more like a, uh, a drip, uh, uh, you know, indoctrination by drip test rather than the FOSS who comes at you and, and, and throws it all at you. Right. And, yep. and, and so I'm proud to be part of that, but I'm purposely stepping away 
I, I, I want the kids to uh, run it the way they, uh, they, they think is, is, uh, you know, most advantageous for the world. And yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, we have, uh, received really nice accolades uh, on the content and, most importantly, I think we're helping to change and educate the lives of people that need to know this. Uh, the, the, the population of El Salvador, for example, like I said, look, Americans generally are the most privileged population in the world. Um, they're not the ones that are going to benefit the most by learning about this opportunity. It's the lesser privileged countries. And so, yeah. Uh, these guys, these kids are doing amazing. Uh, we've had people reaching out who want to help more. Uh, all I can say is, uh, it's a great community to be part of. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. You remember when Larry Lapard had that uh, party and, uh, it, it, uh, you and I were at, this is what Bitcoin's all about. I, I never met a, a community that is so, such a giving community. Okay. Willing to give their time and their effort, uh, when you work on wall street where I did, I mean, there's not a lot of givers on wall street. Like it's a zero sum game. In fact, if the world is 85% taker and 15% giver, I think wall street is 99 taker and 1% giver. And the Bitcoin community is actually the flip side. It's like 85% giver and 15% taker. It's a beautiful community to be part of. And, and that's why look, I never would have met guys like you, Jeff Booth, Larry Lapard. Uh, you know, all of these influencers, they aren't doing it because they they're doing it because they feel it's a it's a greater good. Are they gonna, you know, make financial gain if our outcome uh plays out? Yeah, but that's not exactly why we're we're doing it. Even at the Bitcoin Miami conference. How often did you hear price being mentioned, which was very little, relative to opportunities that are being generated with this technology, right, Stefan? And, and this is what the yeah, you know traditional media guys they always they always paint us as being a bunch of wackos who are have fun staying poor and all this shit. Ah, uh, the majority of us are more like, hey, we're trying to change the world. We want to build a world that our children would be proud and and happy to live in. Uh, for the kids, right? We're doing this for the kids. So sum wrapping a long thing that lookingglasseducation.com is my efforts to be involved in something that will make the world a better place for the kids, full stop. Absolutely. And so there's so much, there's so much different education out there and sometimes different angles can appeal to different people, right? So obviously there's podcast stuff. You're yeah. a regular on podcasts out there for us. Uh, obviously, there's my show, there's, you know, Sailor Academy, there's Looking Glass Education, there's the material we're doing at Swan. Uh, there, there's just all this stuff out there. And whoever gets to it, well, you, you know, that, that what, whatever material you find, or if you find some article on Bitcoin magazine, and then that sends you down the rabbit hole, you know, these are all different pathways that people can take. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the probably the probably some of the key takeaways. Uh, sell your bonds, buy some Bitcoin, uh, trying to learn about Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, so listeners go and check out, uh, lookingglasseducation.com and follow Greg over at, uh, Foss, Greg Foss on Twitter. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Greg, thank you again for joining me. Can I just thank you and yes. Swan as well? A huge, uh, fan of, uh, what Corey has done for the space, uh, a fan of other people that are a uh, part of the, the Swan Bitcoin family. Uh, you know, uh, friends, uh, Natalie Brunel and, and the light that are doing new shows, uh, under the Swan Bitcoin banner. This is so valuable. So thanks for having me, uh, forever, for, uh, friends that I've made in this community. Uh, I know we're going to win. We have to win for the kids and it makes it easier when you have a group of people that, uh, are cut from the same, uh, ethical, uh, desires as we are so really really appreciate you having me uh daz bay in uh aussie is going to some bitcoin bash somewhere up in the uh in in queensland or something this weekend so shout out to yeah, him Poon. and all, yeah. the, all, all, all the guys that are up there uh from canada thanks for the support and uh we'll talk to you soon all right thank you